Well, last week, uh, last week we, actually two weeks ago, we looked at the first chapter of Joel. So we're beginning a, a short series on this minor prophet. And uh, in that first chapter, we read of a great plague of locusts that would come upon the nation of Israel, a horrible and a devastating plague that would grab the full attention of everyone who lived in its path. And the utter destruction would leave no one unscathed. And it was, uh, it was without mercy, mechanically destroying everything in its paths so that every aspect of life, human or otherwise, would be altered. Now today we're going to move on to chapter 2 of Joel. Chapter 1 described a real historical, agricultural, and economic occurrence that pounded on the nation of Israel. And in chapter 2, the Lord opens our eyes even further to an even greater threat. So if you take your Bibles and join me in the book of Joel, chapter 2. We're going to probably cover about the first 13 or 15 verses this morning. We'll see. Now it starts out by sounding an alarm. It says, blow a trumpet in Zion. And whenever in the Old Testament they said, you, you heard them say, blow a trumpet, this is what came to people's minds. This is a shofar. This is a, an amazing instrument. I'm not going to play it this morning, but I'm not going to play it for a reason. And the reason I'm not going to play it is we have to be ready for things that will come upon us and we don't know when they're going to come upon us. And there will be no warning. Okay? There will be no immediate warning. We just have to know that it's coming and be ready for it. Okay? So for me to blow this, to talk about the kind of thing that is coming, okay, this really wouldn't be appropriate to let you know that it is an immediate thing, that you're going to hear a oral warning about it just before it hits. Okay, uh, this says, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on, on my holy mountain. In Baraboo and in the surrounding communities in Sauk counties, we get warnings too, don't we? Okay, uh, there are sirens that go off when tornadoes are sighted or their conditions are prime for natural disaster. And these sirens begin and we hear them and we're supposed to know what they mean as to whether they're extended or short blasts. How many know what they mean? That's what I thought. I forget too. I don't know. Uh, I just know when I hear it, I better pay attention, right? But sometimes things come upon us and we don't have any warning. We just need to be ready for them, no matter when they come. So let's read on. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For a day, for the day of the Lord is coming. It might be a good exercise whenever you see the words, the day of the Lord, in your Bible, to underline that. It's a common theme throughout the scriptures, but we see a concentration of, these, of this phrase in the prophets, the day of the Lord. We see it Old Testament, we see it New Testament. But whenever the day of the Lord comes, the, the response of the inhabitants should be a trembling. Uh, because, verse 2, it is a day of darkness, it is a day of gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. By the way, as we go through this, understand, whenever things are repeated in the scripture, especially when they're repeated close to each other, that means the author is putting a special emphasis on those things. And we're seeing this word darkness, gloom. We're going to see the blotting out of light also as we read on. It's a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and a powerful people. There has never been before. Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Okay. Notice the absolutes that we just read there. I mean, like, this will be it, is what the author is saying. Verse 3, fire devours before them, and behind them a flame 
burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble like a powerful army drawn up for battle. By the way, how many, as we read this, are thinking back to the plague of locusts that we read about the week before, wondering if this is a description of those plagues? Okay, let's read on. Before them, people are in anguish and all the faces grow pale. Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their path. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. Whatever fortifications are set up against them, they destroy. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. In other words, there is no escaping them. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are what? Darkened and the stars withdraw their shining The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? It's a rhetorical question. No one in and of themselves can. Some scholars believe that these verses are likening uh, a future military invasion uh, to, to the plague of locusts. It could be the Syrian or the Babylonian invasions of Israel that are yet to take place. Others say that these verses are a militaristic description of the locusts that we read in the chapter before, meaning that Joel is simply likening the locust invasion to a great nation's army. I agree with those to a certain degree because I think there's a reason that Joel talks about the locust before he begins to talk about the day of the Lord. And we're supposed to draw those parallels. However, what is happening here is Joel is using the invasion of the locust as a warning of even worse things that are yet to come. Now, would God really do that? Would God really send a horrible, destructive plague of insects that would cause famine and severe hardship and even death just to warn humanity of something that would be far worse that is yet to come? Would God do that? something that is yet to come that is called the day of the Lord. As you ponder on would God do that, ask yourself, would you do that? What would you be willing to do to get the attention of people, people that you love, that are facing certain death unless they stop what they are doing, pay attention to their circumstance, and seek shelter. If a tornado were coming and your kids were in the backyard screaming and having fun and not paying attention to you as you stood on the porch yelling at them to run into the house and to get into the basement, what would you be willing to do to get their attention or to get them into the basement? You'd probably be willing to do just about anything, right, to save your children. You'd probably scream at the top of your lungs, even though you might be a person that rarely screams at the top of their lungs. You would probably be even to run out, even though you don't normally run, or at least waddle as fast as you can, which is what I do these days, and physically grab them by the scruffs of their necks and drag them down the basement, even if they resist you. You'd probably be willing to do that in order to save their lives. So the question is, what trumpet would you sound? Okay. 
If you saw your two-year-old about to stick a hanger in an electrical outlet and you were too far away to get there in time to stop him, would you scream at him, bloody murder? And if he wasn't paying attention to your screams, would you pick up a great big beanbag chair and hurl it across the room to knock him away from that outlet before the hanger gets in there, taking the risk that he might be hurt a little bit with the beanbag chair, but not as much as the hanger? What trumpet would you blow to sound that alarm? But my guess is, if you're a parent, you're going to protect your kids, right? And as humanity, do we realize how much God loves us and how much he wants to save us? But he won't with our, without our cooperation. Here in Joel, God is blowing the trumpet of locusts, alarm, in order to get the people of Israel to turn back to him before the day of the Lord arrives. For as our text says, the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? The day of the Lord is something to be avoided at all costs. What will God allow into our lives or into the lives of others to save unrepentant souls from death and hell? What might he allow to shake us out of our complacency, out of our inattentiveness to him, or out of our busyness in order to save our souls? What might God allow into our lives? The day of the Lord is spoken throughout the prophets, and it designates a coming time of great divine and catastrophic, cataclysmic judgment upon the sins of humanity. Isaiah writes this, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. And by, I'm going to read you a bunch of scriptures about the day of the Lord. Look for repeating themes as we go through. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Ezekiel writes, the day of the Lord is near, a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. Amos in chapter 5 verses 18 through 20 we read this, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? This is interesting. In other words, there are some people, they want God to come. They want God to kill all those sinners and to wipe them out. And I know people like that today. And I'm saying, they don't get it. They don't understand how horrible the day of the Lord is going to be. I remember sitting in a class in Denver Seminary and a professor talking about the day of the Lord and he talked about Christians that he knew who almost relished the day of the Lord. And he said, I, sometimes I think pit, people picture God as this wild-eyed deity who's had all he can take and with this craziness he has his divine sickle and he's just cutting down people and leaving in this huge bloodbath. And he says, that's not how I picture the day of the Lord. Yes, it will be a day of wrath. But he says, I see tears in the eyes of Christ as he executes judgment on earth. Because one thing we know is our God is a God of mercy. And one of the things we know is that he warns us over and 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 over. And I could go on like that for days and not say enough overs. How God warns us to come to him and seek shelter in him so that when the day of the Lord comes, we will be safe in him. 
It's not his will that any should perish. He is a loving God, but he is a just God. And for those who think, well, I'm the righteous one. He's not going to take me. We need to remember so that we don't puff ourselves out in pride thinking we're so righteous. You're right. The righteousness that's going to save you is not your righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ who gave it to you in his mercy because you begged for it. We'll only be getting what we don't deserve, you see. Amos, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and then a bear met him. Or he went into his house and leaned his hand against the wall and then a serpent bit him. It is not the day of the Lord, darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it. It's, you know, it's not this thing that you're going to be warned about just before it happens. It's going to be something that God has warned us over and over and over and over and over again. Sound the trumpet now because it's going to come like a thief in the night when it comes. Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 through 17 The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and of gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. You might be thinking, well, that's all Old Testament stuff. Everybody knows that God in the Old Testament, he's a mean and vindictive God. Well, let's hear what Jesus says about the day of the Lord. Because in Matthew 24, verses 19 through 31, Jesus describes the day of the Lord and he applies it to the time when he will return to judge the earth. Verse 19 says, and alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infant in those days, pray that your flight might not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it for false priests False Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Warning, 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 warning. No Christ now, so when the false Christs come, you know the real Christ and you won't be deceived. See, I have told you beforehand, Jesus says, so if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out there. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Oh, when he comes, you will know it, is what Jesus is saying. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. And Jesus goes on to say, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken and then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with a power and a glory, and the trumpet call of God will, sh- will sound, right? You go to Thessalonians chapter 4. We're 
talking about the rapture which is going to come for the church at that time. That's why you want to be part of his kingdom, part of his church. If you want to escape the day of the Lord, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. The day of the Lord is coming. It is coming. James Boyce writes, the disasters of this life, locust invasions, plagues, famine, wars, natural catastrophes, these are little judgments compared to the day of the Lord, but they are warnings of the wrath to be revealed. The things that you suffer in your life today, how do you explain them? All the disasters that we experience in life, the small trumpet blasts that sound an alarm to us personally, Everybody stop and think, what's blasted you lately? <laughs> what's blasted you in your lifetime? Unexpected death of a spouse? Of a child? Of a friend? Struck by disease out of nowhere? Lost your job? Lost your career? Had a debilitating accident? They seem unfair. They hit us without warning. The effects can linger for years or they can be over in a flash. However, there is purpose behind them. They are trumpets. They are there to draw our minds and hearts to Christ, the giver of life. They are precursors of a time that is coming that will be far, far worse than the pain that we feel today. They are warnings to us, and perhaps even more so, to others. So why would the Lord ask the righteous to suffer? And frankly, I can't think of anything more powerful than a righteous man or a righteous woman who are in the throes of deep, dark suffering who speak the name of Jesus with confidence and light. That's power. Because what's more important? To be ready for the day of the Lord? Or to live life with no problems? Kind of a no-brainer answer, isn't it? Be ready. The day of the Lord will be far worse than anything we experience in this life. We need a Savior who is faithful to save. Through the dark times, will we then be faithful to him? I'm going to ask some musicians to come up and sing a song for you now. It's called, Though You Slay Me. And in the middle of the song, you're going to hear part of a sermon from John Piper. The title of the sermon was called, The Glory of God in Sight of Eternity. Listen to the words of this song.
momentary not only is all your affliction light in comparison to eternity and the glory there but all of it is totally meaningful every millisecond of your pain from the fallen nature or fallen man every millisecond of your misery in the path of obedience is producing a peculiar glory you will get because of that. I don't care if it was cancer or criticism. I don't care if it was slander or sickness. It wasn't meaningless. It's doing something. It's not meaningless. Of course you can't see what it's doing. Don't look to what you see. When your mom dies, when your kid dies, when you've got cancer at 40, when a car careens into the sidewalk and takes her out, don't, don't say, it's meaningless. It's not. It's working for you an eternal weight of glory. Therefore, therefore, do not lose heart. But take these truths, all the ones you've heard in every message, and day by day, focus on them. Preach them to yourself every morning. Get alone with God and preach His Word into your mind until your heart sings with confidence that you are new and cared for. As a benediction, let me read verses 12 through 14 of Joel chapter 2. And here's the good news. 
Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your, gar- rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord our God, for he is gracious. He is merciful. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over the disasters in our lives. He does not turn us away. Heavenly Father, we lift up each soul in this room. Some, Lord, we need to return to you. We need our confessions to be true and honest. We need to sense contrition, Lord. We need to get our feelings behind the facts of our sin. And we need to change. Lord, some who have never given their lives to you, Lord, the warnings have been sounded today over and over again, even within the last hour. Lord, I pray that they will hear that trumpet call. That they would give their lives to you and rush to you, Lord, and see you as that strong tower in whom they need to seek shelter for their lives. And that they would love you and follow you all the days of your life. And when the day of the Lord comes, they will be safe in you. Thank you, Lord for calling us. Thank you for making a way for us through Jesus to that safe place in your bosom. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.